Now, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Ross Linda from the Center of Applied Data Sciences, otherwise known as CATS. Ross Linda, the stage is yours. Thank you, Nafisa. Hi, everybody. Right, before we even start into our topic, uh, I think part of uh, the earlier sharing that we actually mentioned is around B2100 project. And with me today, I have uh, two really highly experienced, impactful ladies with me uh, from University of Malaya. Um, Associate Professor Dr. Maizatul Akmar Ismail, and from the industry side, uh, the Chief of HR of Experian, Madam Chua Chai Peng. Um, and both ladies actually have put in the mileage of over 20 years of experience in their field. So you are actually very lucky today to have their presence um, and to actually talk a little bit on this topic. And before I even get started, I would like to bring um, all of us on the same page because I think not all of us are talking um, data and literacy and what it is. And of course, you are maybe being bombarded with the uh, uh, term P2100. Um, so let me first uh, bring to you um, the context here. Yeah? Um, what we are talking about today. Right, so CATS actually um, embarked into this Project 2100. Our mission is to future-proof the world. And uh, in order to attempt to future-proof the world, first, we must embark on future-proofing our nation. Right, and um, of course, uh, we are actually uh, in this journey since 2016 um, and having uh, went through this journey uh, and where we are at, uh, it's only, you know, the right timing. We also include um, ASEAN in our approach uh, today. So what it means when I said that it is part of nation building initiative. Right, that brings me to this next slide. If some of you are not yet familiar uh, with my digital blueprint, um, the economy blueprint, you can get hold of this paper. Um, but this is a landscape of how um, I've actually summarized it. Um, my digital blueprint actually tries to enable Malaysia to transform into a digitally driven high income nation. So the first, uh, key objective, high income nation. At the same time, the second objective is to be a regional leader in the digital economy. Okay, two vision. Now, from that, then there are uh, three elements where uh, the, the objectives are being defined further uh, and drilled down. So that how do we actually transform our nation? And I would like to highlight from these three key areas here, uh, where the play or today's conversation come about. We are gonna actually link up to this objective two, talking about digital talents um, and digital talents, you cannot demerge from not being data-driven, uh, not being data literate, because digital means data. Um, and it kind of jive with the thrust of building agile and competent digital talents. And with that, uh, why CATS um, bringing in all the partners together to work hand in hand because it's not our journey alone. It has to be an ecosystem to make this happen and successfully happen. And that brings us to actually uh, moving forward, achieving phase three to become a regional market producer. And for CATS, it's of course regional market producer of talents, but then from uh, uh, the industry is about the talents being uh, able to anchor products and solutions um, regionally, being a regional player. So today, 
uh, what it uh, what I would like to bring to you is uh, being a regional player means that we also have to look at surrounding nations, care about our neighbors as well. So uh, being part of ASEAN countries, this project 2100 uh, also concerns the issue around youth and employability and how we can actually future-proof the youth in ASEAN. And why is it that this landscape is important? Because we are neighbors. So if our neighbor do not do well, then it will actually uh, disturb the surrounding neighborhood, right? Um, so if you look at the pandemic and how youth are actually being impacted, um, the unemployability rate in ASEAN has actually increased by 43% just because of the pandemic. So ASEAN, what happened to our country? So in our country alone, yeah, uh, stats shows that it has been the highest ever the um, unemployment rate in our country, whereby about 800,000 people are jobless or unemployed. And the worrying part is that 80% or more are contributed by our graduates. Okay, so that's facts number one. Facts number two that um, become a worrisome fact for me um, is that not only uh, our graduates find it very difficult to land a job, but our graduates are also right now earning at minimum wage. So those who land their job uh, a job during this, this period are landing jobs which are really underpaid. And we, are, we talk about minimum wage, and this is report as a uh, first of uh, April this year. Yeah, I hope this trending is just temporary and is changing. Um, and minimum wage for Malaysia is 1,200. And that's very sad news, right? But we're worry not, we are going to discuss this and all of us, um, all of you today who's listening to this, we can make a difference. Okay, so why is it that youth and these challenges of un unemployability is something that we need to be concerned about? Um, one, if you are earning 1,200 ringgit, it means that you have very, very low purchasing power. How do you even beat infl inflation? How do you even want to progress in life? And it also means that uh, we lost a lot of opportunity of human capital uh, quality. People are underemployed. So the quality of what you can produce is being lowered to a lower skill kind of job. And not only that, right? Um, we talk about investor. And we talk about investor, it means that investor will come where the talents are. And when our talents do not um, have the avenue to um, actually gain the experience of being a skilled workforce, then investors are also not going to be attracted to come to the country. And that also means that you know, less revenue is being collected through uh, tax and, and such. So development will halt. And when that happens, we will face a lot of social problems. And that will be very sad if we lost our next generation. So that's, that's the, the, the landscape, yeah, so that we are all on the same page. So P2100 at the very um, uh, 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 basic level, yeah, we are talking about providing education that matters, yeah, and thus we have to partner with the educator. So we have my today. And then we have uh, Chaiping today with us because they are the industry that has the demands of all these great talents. And together, you, me, uh, where I bridge the uh, supply and the demand side and how we actually work together so that we make and we realize all this vision about uh, being the, the regional um, leader uh, in talents and uh, talents in the digital world, I would say, yeah. So uh, 
the community that gets uh, uh, launching across uh, ASEAN are all the community that brings that ecosystem together, whereby you are the community of probably individuals who are uh, looking for uh, opportunity to future-proof yourself. The enterprises are the ones that, you know, demanding for that kind of talents. Um, and of course, the uh, partners can be um, the supply side, the learning platforms, the provider of education. And um, these days, we saw that like-minded organizations or the, the agencies, the sponsorship bodies are also coming on board to help uh, those who are underprivileged to also be having an equal opportunity for the learning. All righty. So that's the context of where we are today. Now, I think we are also short of time. So I just stop my sharing and let's delve into our discussion for today. Our chit chatting, I would say. Um, and <laughs> uh, first of all, um, I think I would like to bring uh, this interesting um, uh, statement, yeah, because my founder, Sharala Agzri, uh, said that cats believe that data literacy is, an, uh, is as important as reading literacy. So what is very interesting is that my mom was an ex-teacher, uh, and those days, um, she's now in like uh, early 70s, and those days, being a teacher means to teach um, our youth back then to read. But today, being an educator, Prof. Mai, uh, it's more complex. And today, the statement of data literacy as important as reading literacy. Let's hear from you. What do you think of this statement? Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. Hopefully, you know, you benefit from the previous sessions. Hopefully you can get something from our session uh, as well. Okay, um, data literacy. So data literacy is about uh, making sense of data, making sense of what you see. Uh, for instance, uh, we have this, um, you know, one of our alumni, so uh, he, is the one that is uh, in charge of you know interview uh, young graduates or fresh graduates coming to their organizations okay so uh, uh, there's a lot of questions so of course uh, fresh graduates especially from computer science and it so they expect um, technical skills kinds of um, interview but what my friend did is that uh, he give this one applicant a picture of watermelon the picture of watermelon okay so and then um he asked that um applicants okay what is this okay and that student said um not the student the, <laughs> the applicant said oh this is a watermelon uh, yes uh, yeah i can see that this is watermelon what else what else can you tell about this picture um then it's a long pause and the the applicant said I cannot see anything apart from watermelon. What else you want me to see? Okay, <laughs> so maybe this is opening statement. Okay, so data literacy in the sense that um, what what is it about is um, ability to read, write, communicate data in context. In context. So uh, coming back to the watermelon, what what is expected from the uh, applicants is for him to describe what he see the color of it, okay, perhaps that's a red watermelon or yellow watermelon, based on what? Based on the shapes of the stripes, perhaps. Okay, so that is what we want to see. So yes, I agree with uh, Linda, okay? As much as uh, reading literacy is important, data literacy is important as well. So look at the watermelon image as data. What can you say about it? Everyone knows it's watermelon. What is beyond that? Okay, so if you put that into different contexts, okay, you put that into um, housewife context. So maybe that watermelon is for dessert after dinner. Okay, if you look at it as a farmer's context, okay, so that is the first harvest 
um, watermelon of the year. So, you know, uh, things got different, okay? the story got different if you put it in different contexts. So if you ask me whether it is as important, it is very important nowadays. So regardless from which streams you are, okay, whether you are science streams or non-science stream, okay, it is very important okay, now that you equip yourself with data literacy. So what is data literacy, if you ask me again? The ability to interpret data based on context, what situation the data is in. Okay. <laughs> that is wonderful. I never thought the story of watermelon is the easiest story to relate to data. And I would borrow that from my in no my problem. Bags delivery. <laughs> because it is, it's, it's always like oh throwing jargons and all that, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, that 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 that's wonderful. And I think that brings me to uh chiping about the industry. Because I understand that you know, coming from uh, experience and the um the industry is all about aggregating data to the benefit of your client and all that. Uh, what does data literacy mean uh, to your organization and your client? Put into context of industry application. <laughs> oh, typing, you're muted. Okay, can you, yeah, because I couldn't unmute just now. The organizer didn't, uh, didn't allow me to unmute. So apologies. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm going to kind of write on what uh, Prof Mai said earlier, right? Um, and, uh, and, and I want to kind of talk about data literacy probably in its uh, plainest um, form and not kind of use and, and debunk a bit of the myth. Because I think uh, data and, uh, and I think over the last few years, data has been, uh, you know, used as a jargon that sometimes, you know, for laymen, even for myself, you know, it's hard to comprehend. And so leveraging on uh, watermelon and uh, leveraging on uh, what Prof said, right, around uh, being able to read, uh, write and communicate. And the communicate piece is uh, very important. Today, um, post-pandemic, right, uh, more than ever, an IR 4.0 technical transformation, um, technological transformation has accelerated uh, the accumulation of data, right? So let me debunk it a little bit, right? So we have always been collecting data. I mean, even if you think about the caveman, right? So Prof uses a watermelon, maybe if I can use caveman, right? I mean, they go out, you know, they, they are hunter-gatherers, they come back, you know, they need to look at the lay of the land, come back in, and then, you know, see, you know, is it dangerous today? What's the weather like? You know? So it's all you know, reading and, and, and comprehending the data, come back to see whether they should go and, and, and hunt and it, it, whether it's uh, dangerous and, and all that. So I think in those days, maybe it's very plain, but today because of, you know, social media, because of technology, we have accumulated so much data over the last couple of decades, I would like to think, right? That uh, now more than ever, and the world has become more complex. That is why data literacy has become even more complex, right? And we need all sorts of, you know, people talk about uh, data modeling and, you know, all sorts of technologies and platforms to help you uh, interpret the data. So data literacy is really, as what Prof said, right, is really the ability to read, write, um, comprehend and communicate the data, synthesizing the data and making sense of the data. So now that you've got all this information, what do you do with the information? What are you going to do with the data so that you can draw perspectives draw insights and also make very, very calculated decisions because the world has become more complex. Um, we live in a, in a complex world. I mean, uh, nonetheless, uh, and needless to say, right, uh, it is COVID. And uh, if we think about VUCA, for example, right, uh, VUCA, it's real. We are living VUCA today. And, um, you know, for, for you out there who may not know VUCA, please do Google it. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, take time to... to Explain VUCA because that's a, that's a probably a lecture of its own. So it's VUCA. Um, think and, and the pandemic has accelerated VUCA. There's just so much chaos around us, so much uh, uncertainty around us. And therefore, whatever data that we have collated, right, um, whether it's in the recent uh, months 
four decades, right, we need to now make sense of that data so that we can be even more um, uh, decisive in, the, in some of the steps we're going to take or the measures we're going to take, right, in a very, very complex world. So hopefully that gives you a bit of pers perspective about what data is. And um, again, right, for a layman, even like myself, I like to think that we have always been accumulating data. It's just been accelerated over the last few decades. So don't be overwhelmed by it. I'm still learning, although I'm in a data and technology company. Um, we, we just have to embrace it, try to make sense of it. And if we can't, right, there are many, many experts now and uh, many of our uh, academic institutions, right, are already, you know, having uh, faculties um, in, in data or data science, right? And we can leverage and partner um, with some of, uh, you know, these talents out there or hire them into our organization, right, uh, to, to help us make sense of data. So I know, you know, Linda, you know, talked about, uh, it was probably a little bit bleak, you know, when I was listening in, you know, minimum wage and all that. I like to, you know, per perhaps throw a little bit of a positivity, despite the pandemic, right, uh, experience has continued to hire, and uh, we don't pay minimum wage. I think, you know, we pay, you know, two or three times more than minimum wage, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, for all the talent that we have in Malaysia, I still wonder why we can't hire as fast, you know, as we can. And uh, all my global stakeholders are very impressed with, with the talent that we have um, in Malaysia, actually. So I'll kind of pause that for a while, Linda, and then maybe, you know, we'll just, you know, further this conversation, right, as it, uh, you know, gets a bit more robust, I, I believe. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Hey, thank you, Jaiping. Uh, I love that you quickly touched on that because, uh, you know, uh, in, in the course of this discussion, we might uh, all could potentially overlook that, that side of things as well. Uh, but you're right, Chai Ping, that, um, you know, CATS, uh, given the mandate by some of the foundation bodies during this pandemic period, uh, to quickly help uh, rescale some of our uh, graduates who found themselves in that predicament, right? Um, and then not only we are responsible to rescale, but we are also responsible to place. And we thought that, my God, that task of uh, placing is daunting, not just, you know, place with the 1,200 salary. We are given the task to place them above 3,000 ringgit salary. And we are trying to beat that, that dozen stat that got published saying that the average is 1,200. So what a daunting task, right? But uh, this world is actually an eye-opening for me who stepped into that daunting task, working with organizations like uh, you guys who are willing to, to put a bet and you know give that opportunity at a higher level pay scale despite pandemic and all that. So what I would like to actually conclude uh, is that yes, uh, those talents who are equipped with the right skills and, and all that, organizations are on average right now paying around three, five at entry level. So um, yeah, the stats can be beaten. <laughs> okay, that actually, uh, brings me to uh, nicely to actually question two uh, of our discussion because uh, uh, one of the key things that always uh, talents would come and uh, ask me about um, is where uh, their foundation uh, of studies uh, is kind of making them irrelevant because they think that this area uh, of skills, knowledge area, and all that can only uh, easily be uh, adopted by people who are from STEM background. So um, from that aspect, Prof, what would university steps be like uh, to make sure that the non-STEM are not left behind uh, in terms of opportunities like this? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Linda. So um, it's a bitter truth, I would say. Okay, because uh, it's always, um, you know, for the past five years, when we look at the uh, graduate employability uh, statistics, okay, it's always, um, you know, the STEM stream, okay, uh, engineering, computer science, uh, medic, dentistry, um, are the one that is 
higher okay than those of uh, non science okay, arts um, arts and social science um, so um, our recent effort okay uh, by the university is to offer uh, we call it an elective course okay open course for everyone to take so we offer data analytics course business intelligent course social informatic course okay so we we have one cluster we call it um uh, in um we call it iTechy. okay so we offered i think around 30 subjects under that cluster uh, contributed by various um, science-based faculties okay to equip students with analytical knowledge so um, analytics uh, sounds technical yeah uh, so uh, with analytics okay uh, one would uh, associate it with having good uh, mathematics background so what is the relationship of maths or physics with this analytics okay so it is all about making sense of data being logical being logical so when you say something okay it is not it, it, it is supposed to be beyond the eyes okay so what is it okay so if you put it into different context going back to my watermelon example okay so if you put it into different context okay what does it mean okay so because you not know, the meaning the context on how you should uh, communicate um, the information to others different okay um, in comparison if you put it into uh, let's say agriculture context or in the medical or health context okay or in economic context okay so uh, what we do uh, at the university level is to equip these students okay so um, equipping students with um, you know analytics um, course is one one move we could say so another thing is that um, nowadays there's a lot of online free online courses Okay, offer i think cats from times to times okay you do offer because i can see that there's always advertisement uh, you need talent with this and that and then you will train them um, into specific schemes so but um i think one one of the way is for non-science students to take this opportunity and and do not think or do not okay when uh, i might want to go few steps back okay before this thing okay during our time okay it's always that our parents wants us to take or becomes an engineer okay be a doctor uh, but nowadays okay um even like myself okay i would tell my children um maybe you don't want to do um, engineering or computer science maybe you want to do economics or maybe you want to become a lawyer or maybe you want to venture into business admin something like that why because um you know as a parent okay we can see that we are led by by the arts and social science people we are led by them okay they are our bosses and we work for them okay so i think one of the one of the ways that uh, why, why why students are actually venturing more into arts and social science because of the parents themselves okay or um, you know you have the stigma that science is difficult so why make yourself miserable studying for three years four years okay and then at the end of the day um, you'll be led by your friends from arts and social science so uh, that is not the issue here okay so the thing is that okay um you have to equip yourself it uh, analytics is just a shift of how you think a shift of how you look at one information one piece of information okay so it is not just what you see it is beyond that okay you uh when i I go back to my watermelon example. That is just descriptive. You are describing that. Uh, even some student okay, cannot describe watermelon well. Okay, so it's like uh, I don't know. Uh, typing perhaps you have uh, experience. Okay, um, I once interview students for our course. Okay, because it's it's selling like hotcakes. We we have to interview. Okay, not just relying on results because we want to see their communication skills. So one simple question is like. Describe yourself. My name is this. I come from here. Uh, I'm uh, 20 years old or 19 years old. And that's it. We expect more than that. 
we expect more than that. So um, one thing is, you know, we equip students with analytical skills, going back to Linda's question. The other thing is that you have to build on the communication skills. Okay, having knowledge, um, you need to articulate, okay, whatever that you have in mind to other people. Okay, you need to tell them, be descriptive about it, okay? And then from that, okay, what else? What can, uh, how can you relate that information? How can you relate watermelon with what is going to happen in another one month time, in another six months time, in another one year time? Does the watermelon stays the same during pandemic or after pandemic when the time becomes endemic? Okay, so um, this is the skills that you, um, do, uh, you should not wait okay, for you to learn. You need to, um, you know, take one step further. Okay, I know you, are, you, you have assignments and I don't have time. You know, I'm being loaded uh, with assignment and all. Integrate that in your assignment. Okay, it is not specified perhaps by your lecturer. Okay, but you can do that. Okay, as part of your assignment. So be creative, things out of the box. Okay, so these are the, the, the assignments that your lecturer is looking for. Okay, something that is not uh, from whatever that is in the answer scheme, right? So I don't know whether I'm answering in your context of questions, Linda, but I hope, you know, I, I, I give you, I give students some ideas, okay, uh, how university is trying to do this, but the effort is very small. Okay, it's just um, I think about eight credits out of hundred and thirty or hundred and forty credits. The overall credits hours that students have to take. Okay, um, of their you no know, eight semesters or four years or three and a half years of studies. So this is just like a fraction of it. Okay, but I think most importantly is the students themselves. If you want to go forward, if you want to make yourself. Uh, um, relevant to the industry okay this is what you have to do equip yourself with all the additional knowledge okay because um if you um i think it, it, it is somewhat funny okay because the advertisement um you you know that uh, okay i i'm not saying this uh to to your industry perhaps uh, uh experience have got different ways but you know looking at the at the advertisement okay um okay uh, fresh graduates and then Importantly, have some working experience. Where did the working experience come from when they are just graduated? Okay, so uh, we always told our uh, graduates, okay, so that's the working experience can come from whatever course that you take online, whoever that you engage, okay, when you participate in competitions, if you have, you know, work on small scale of project, put everything in. Okay, perhaps that is the experience that the industry is looking for. <laughs> Okay, Linda, over back to All you. Right. Thank you, Prof. Mai. So, Chan yeah, Ping. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, no, thanks, thanks, Linda. I, I, I just want to kind of add on, right, and, and uh, build on what Prof said, right? I, I think, you know, um, as, as an employer, you know, I push very hard for early careers. And I've said to my recruiters, I've said to my, uh, my line managers and hiring managers, right, we, we can't expect you know, uh, our our young talent to have experience. I mean, yes, may, they may have worked in Speed 99. Does that add up? That tells me about attitude. It may not, it, it may not meet our requirements, right? Coming into experience in terms of uh, work experience. But, you know, we all started somewhere. Uh, we all started with nothing, right? And, and someone gave us a chance, right? So I tell my hiring managers, by the same token, we need to pay it forward. We need to give these young people a chance, right? Um, and an and opportunity because a lot of them, they, they are probably clueless. They don't know what's out there. And, and the world is a very complex place, I, I said before. So I think um, for, for you, you know, aspiring graduates here who are coming into workforce, you know, please heed, you know, um, Prof's call. You know, um, we, we say go the extra, extra mile, right? Um, recently, but I think with the pandemic, we, we need to go the extra two miles now or even three miles because the extra mile is just not enough anymore right and even for myself um, as an employer we have to also go extra two or three miles because it is despite the pandemic it is still uh, an employee's market 
you know, tech talent uh, is still sought after. Talent in Malaysia are still very well sought after, right? We touch a little bit, I think, Prof, uh, Linda, you touch a little bit about STEM and there is always, you know, a, a kind of a slant to STEM students, you know. I myself am, uh, uh, as a, it is a product of uh, uh, arts, right? So I, I can't pretend, uh, Prof said, you know, I can't pretend I'm supervising all these uh, brilliant tech people but uh, or STEM people, but uh, I, I try, like, I also try to blend in, right? But, you know, if you have a passion for STEM, you know, uh, go for it. Uh, and for those of you who may not have, uh, you know, uh, not, not pursuing STEM as a course of study, you know, fret not because, you know, I've got so many examples. I've got a finance, I've got a finance team, my, my global finance uh, center of excellence. Uh, they deal with uh, the robotics and all that. And they are finance people. They are finance people who are doing robotics and, and so on and so forth for experience globally. And our global COE uh, center of excellence is based in Malaysia. I've got a couple of psychology, uh, you know, kids who are with us, who are into automation and analytics, right? So it doesn't mean that, you know, you must come from a course of study in STEM to do well, you know? Uh, and and I, I would really want to challenge anyone who tells me that STEM, you know, is better than an arts or social science student, you know, or, or a history student for that matter. Because I, I've seen so many examples of even my own current team, uh, my psychologist person who, will go and um, do an, a, a, a shadowing, uh, you know, a few months of shadowing, right, with my, uh, my robotics team. I mean, she's got such an interest in it that, you know, she's a pure HR psychology uh, past, uh, graduate, but, you know, she, sat, she sits with the tech team just to understand the new technology, technologies that are coming out, right, because she, she just loves technology. So, you know, um, don't ever let anyone tell you if you're not a STEM student that, oh, STEM is better than, you know, a non-STEM person. That's not the case. Because if you have an interest and you take an interest, you know, I've seen people who are non-tech people who dabble with coding. You know, they come up with their own code. I'm like, okay, I have no clue what coding is. I work in a tech company, but I have no clue how they do it. But, you know, so um, I, I think what happens is um, if we can we are able to blend right stem with non stem the clash uh, and and you know is like the clash of the titans right we create because that diversity of thinking and the ability to co create right we will be able to come up with an outcome that we never imagined right because we live now in a world that we never imagined we never imagined the pandemic would come and hit us right we never imagined that so we need more diversity of thinking to co-create and to innovate, right? And that's how the world can become a better place, right? Of course, Linda, I think you had, you know, you have other questions for us or questions from the audience as well. <laughs> well thanks, thanks, thanks Jai Ping. I think that's enthralled me as well. Uh, it, it's funnily because I kind of like relate to, to, to that, but I went on the opposite direction from a STEM student, um, then I, I diverse to, to an art <laughs> and uh, uh, doing human resource and all that, right? And, and that's a, uh, another animal altogether, you know, understanding people is harder to, uh, and a skill where I think even AI is struggling to figure out, right? <laughs> the human nature. Um, Prof, having said that, right, you have watched the, uh, a lot of your uh, talents that you have nurtured uh, and watched them grow. Let's talk about qualities uh, of all these uh, talents that you saw, right? What, I mean, I'm sure being an educator, you kind of like have the ability to predict who would do well <laughs> and uh, that qualities that, that we are going to talk about. Uh, could you share, like, uh, uh, what did you see uh, with, with all the success benchmark these days? Okay, um, um, perhaps, um, okay, uh, we, okay, in my class, okay, um, before, okay, I, I graduated in 1999, so don't count my age. <laughs> okay, so um, we have this one um, guy who's really good. I think the pointer is about 3.8, 3.9. So he can code with his eyes closed. So he's that good. 
Okay, so uh, so uh, as students, okay, so when we have our reunion, we always ask about this guy. So where's this guy? I don't, I don't want to mention names. So <laughs> I don't want to mention names. Okay, <laughs> in case any one of you uh his kids or whatever. Okay, uh, so we always ask about him, and then the in our recent okay, so we heard that okay, uh, he further his studies, uh, doing computer science. So he worked with this big company, he works with IBM. Then he uh, job hopping, working with Apple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then our last reunion, okay. And then um, one of my friends said, okay, you wonder with, uh, where is this guy now? Okay, I, I said, oh, he must be one of the CEO of the tech company. No, he said. He's now a gym instructor. And then he was like, what? <laughs> He's now a gym instructor because he said that uh, I'm done. Okay, uh, that's, I, I have no more patience about it. Okay, so I know everything about it that uh, he said that nothing that I don't know about. So let me do something else. So he's a gym instructor, a successful one because he runs his own gym. And then he did all the, he's, he's the one giving training, not just managing, he's the one giving training. So, uh, okay, so don't, uh, my friend said, don't imagine him as this one tiny little man. Okay, so he is now different with all the muscles and all the, you'll be shocked. So, um, okay, so I don't know whether you consider that as a success story is or not, but people change. So uh, as much as people from, STEM can change to something else. People from non-STEM background can do the same. See, because that's it. There's always this online things, okay. And then, for uh, I think uh, I always always say to my students, okay, it's so unfortunate that we are in this, in this field, computer science, okay. Because every six months, technology change. You have to learn. Sometimes you have to unlearn, and relearn. So. After 20 years, okay, the learning process is non-stop if you want to stay relevant. So some of us now is actually tired of learning. We want to do something else. We want to, to do some things that does not require us to always study, um, go for examinations, okay, get certified of this, get certified of that. Yeah, <laughs> okay, maybe not of all of us, but some of us feel that. Okay, because um, but um, but some of us who want to stay relevant, so see that this is part and parcel of of our interest. So they don't see it as a burden. Okay, some see it as no, I'm now at the age of uh, no, I I cannot accept anything right now. So everything bouncing back. So no, I don't want to be in this uh, field anymore. So. Yeah, we change. So some of us become auditor, some of us venture into real estate, some of us now yeah, uh, doing HR. So, um, but what I can see uh, um, among our, our older students or you know, among people from my batch is that um, whenever, whatever fields they are in, okay, their technical knowledge actually help them to excel better than perhaps others. Why? Because in real estate, okay, they know what tools to use to predict okay, what, what would, would bring them profits in another three years or five years time. Okay, it's not just uh, based on observation because when it's like when you want to buy stocks, okay, then if you look at the experience, um, people, okay, uh, how, uh, what, uh, then people say it's hunch, it's not hunch. It's no longer hunch, you know, nowadays, okay? And then you 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 don't go to see, you know, people see at your palm, okay, and read your fortune, no. Okay, so that is made possible with AI. So whatever field, if they have the knowledge, okay, they, they will do better. Okay, so I can see that, um, I can see that from, from the students, okay, from the people who are not doing, um, codings and be in the computer science or be in the technical side, but whatever field that they are in, they are successful because of the ability to, to look beyond or to, to think forward, okay, then what others are thinking. It's not just looking at what you have in front of you, okay, you have to look beyond that. So for you to, do, to, to be able to do that, you need some skills Okay, to use certain tools, okay, and make interpretations of data using certain 
algorithms okay so nowadays okay all the algorithms are actually stopped for instance if you use power bi or tableau you can just put in certain parameters and click in the click of button you'll see okay so will this be profitable okay um should they stay in that uh doing that for that two three years or you know you should they should start shifting so this is the discussion i was like you know jaw drop okay because they are doing something else but you know they, they relate with whatever they learn okay they relate with you know their logical thinking and i don't i'm not sure if you know if uh, i sit with my of course when when we are staying at college we have people from uh, arts now uh, some of my friends working in uh, as a journalist Okay, uh, working in the media industry. So I think when whenever we, we are with this circle of people, uh, we, we, we seldom heard about that. Okay, they, they will tell just, um, you know, about what whatever that is in the media or whatever it, that is happening now. Sitting with another bunch of people, okay, uh, coming from tech background, okay, even though their, their um, career are now diverse, Okay, you can see, you know, you, you, you feel amazed. Wow. Okay, so they still make use of whatever they learn. Okay. Um, to, uh, uh, and they said that, okay, uh, don't venture into this. Uh, don't do this. Okay. Uh, when Bitcoin first come to, then I, we are still skeptical whether it's safe or not. You know, they are now making millions. Okay. By just sitting at home. So um, I would say, Perhaps that is some value, okay. Uh, but um, I think, yeah, what what is lacking, perhaps, is uh, of course uh, when I talk about friends. Of, of course, we we've, we've been here for about twenty years, so we learn how to talk, we learn how to communicate. But students, okay, uh, if uh, you you just graduate from computer science or from engineering, okay, I think um, what you need to build up, okay, is not so much on your technical skills okay but your communication skills but okay art student social science students have no problem with this that's why i agree with chai ping okay most of them secure did better in the interview compared to this stem student okay because we don't have time to uh, we have time we okay it, it is not fair to say we don't have time we have time but you know most our of our time are actually dedicated to solve uh, whatever assignments given to us okay so uh, we don't have much time to go leisure or doing other things even our leisure time okay we play games we still need, need us to think okay how to win this okay after i win this i want to get token here and token that so you know you are actually consumed so without realizing even though you are playing games which you say that is part of your leisure time you are working, your brain's working. So leisure means going out to the park, do something else. Like Chai Ping said, close your laptop, go somewhere. But leisure, at least for our students that I observe, is playing games, okay? Which <laughs> I don't know whether that's leisure or not. Okay, but for them, if you ask them, I play games, okay? Yeah. During my free time, I like to play games. I'll develop games, okay? after. Uh, I finished this, the top level. Now I'm looking for another game. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> that actually uh, saying that it becomes lack of social skill. And it actually uh, kind of like bring me to uh, yesterday when I had an opportunity to talk to Chai Ping. Uh, she mentioned about other qualities that she would emphasize on when she looks out for talent. And I think it's about time, Chai Ping, that you uh, reiterate back that qualities <laughs> other than the gamers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks. If, I, if you miss out some of the, the comments I made yesterday, Linda, you can always jog my memory or chime in, please. Yeah. I think um, Prof already mentioned some of it, right? Um, I think aptitude is, you know, I think, you know, 3.8, 3.9. And, you know, in my, in my fairly long career, right, um, you know, we, we, yes, we do look at results. I mean, and that's aptitude of it, you know, and, and all this CGPA and all that. But re what really trumps it, right, is really your attitude as well, right? Um, 
uh, how you show up at the interview, right? What do you say in the interview? How do you say it, right? What you say and more importantly, how, uh, how you say it, right? And also, I think the ability to articulate, I think Prof said it, um, curious mindsets, ability to connect the dots, you know, and these are things that, you know, your, your CGPA will only lend you and open that door. Now, now that if the door is open for you already, to me, it's already a privilege, right? And for many of you here, uh, it's already a privilege to be here, to listen in, not just to me, but, you know, um, the earlier speakers and Prof here and, and Linda as well. Right. Um, what are you going to do with that privilege? So when you come for an interview, what are you going to do with that interview? Because, you know, to what Prof said again, you know, we, I've sat in, in interviews where we normally allocate at least 45 minutes to an hour, 10 minutes down. So we are, okay, explaining, you know, about talking about the organization and culture and job and all that. And then we kind of throw it now to the candidate and say, okay, now you tell me. Now, the, the non-ability to articulate right, or speak, or present, or share what's on your mind, it's going to shortchange you in many ways, right? You may be the best computer science students in the world, um, unless you're a Bill Gates, and there are not many Bill Gates around, unfortunately, you know, um, I think you need to be able to share your findings, share your point of view, because a lot of organizations today uh, when we talk about innovation and co-creation and collaboration or even hyper-collaboration, even in scrums, right, in meetings and all that, it's your point of view that any team or any employers will value because every one of us is unique and we bring different points of view to the table. And that is that diversity, right, um, of thinking that we want, you know, even as a fresh graduate, right, and some of our graduates, and we hire many, many graduates, right? Fresh, right? Um, and they really, when, when they come to the table, their ability to express themselves. Even if you think, you know, I mean, sometimes as Malaysian students, you always think, oh, you know, my point of view is not great, like, just the money, you know, but don't, don't shortchange yourself that way. So more importantly, when you come to the, you know, to the interview, please do express yourself because I'm sure there's a lot going in here. And a lot going in here as well, right? Even if it's just expressing a feeling or, you know, saying that actually I took computer science or I took analytics or I did data science because my grandmother wanted me to not be a lawyer or something. I mean, even that, right? Uh, and how you felt about it is already an expression, right? So I always say attitude is important, how you show up, ability to kind of, again, connect the dots, try to make the connection because when you can synthesize data, when you show curiosity in your thinking, it shows that you are thinking. You are, you know, um, making the connections. And that's important because in the real world, it's not the CGPA will get you to that interview. But beyond that, the real world is solving real world issues. It's no longer just about um, your academic results. So when we want to solve real world issues, we need that curious mindset. And that a machine cannot do, you know. Um, and AI can't do it, uh, machine learning can't do it, robots, robots can't do it, right? Because we need to feed the robots. Even with AI, we need to feed the information to come out and it's the humans that are feeding the information, right? So I think, um, um, I, I think these are above and beyond the, the, the technical skills that we are looking for. The, the, you know, for the longest time, we talk about soft skills. Now more than, again, now more than before, soft skills, will be more important in, 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 um, in a pandemic world or post-pandemic world, right? Uh, I'll come back and talk about empathy a little bit more later, Linda. Yeah, I'll just pause okay. there. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think yesterday you did mention about uh, involvement in like societal activities either in uni or not. But uh, I caught on one word you mentioned, office bearer. Yeah. Why is being office bearer something that you would encourage the young people to, to pursue? Yeah, you know, um, I, again, in my years of recruiting, whether locally or overseas and all that, right? And um, we always think that urban children do very well or urban students do very well or overseas students do very well. Um, let me tell you, I, I think what I've seen in my career is, you know, people 
maybe from the outskirts try and strive a bit harder. And people who are, uh, uh, I guess, presumably have less, try a bit harder. So, you know, I, I think again, Prof mentioned this, right? Um, you, you have to go that extra mile. I'm going to say extra two or three miles now, right? Um, when, when you think that you don't have that exposure, right? You will try and say, okay, let me be a committee of the chess club. Or let me try to, you know, be a council member of, you know, whatever, you know, whatever society in the club. So office bearers gives you that additional point of view and perspective of, I guess, in addition to your normal student life, because you are interacting with different sorts of people and different uh, I mean, I think people from different walks of life, right? Whether people from urban or from, you know, another state or East Malaysia or even a foreign student, if there is, right? And, and that will sharpen, right? The saw for you because when you can start integrating different points of view and integrating that into your own thinking, you are then, you are already connecting the dots. You are already using data, right? To refine your decisions, right? And, and that will help you. So I always encourage, I, you know, students, you know, even if you are Bulan Sabit Mera, right? Uh, Red Cross and this and that, right? Even if you're just, oh, helping, I'm a class monitor only. Oh, no, actually, I'm just a, an assistant class monitor or a pengawas or, or, or that. I, I always think that that gives you the added responsibility and uh, that added point of view. So office bearers uh, is always a good way. Uh, you know, to, to kind of strengthen, right, your academic life, right? Uh, the other one is if you get to work part-time somewhere, as I think I mentioned Speed 99 earlier, even just as a cashier or just a, you know, storekeeper or something like that, it gives you a different perspective, right? It, it will, you know, um, and it is also a humbling process because when you have never worked or never, um, you know, uh, been in a, in a position of, um, uh, of responsibility, you never realize how heavy the burden is because once you get, get a taste of it, again, that gives you, um, it refines your character. So it's character building for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I interviewed once uh, for, and I'll, I'll share a couple of stories. One was um, the father was uh, a newspaper seller, you know, uh, the one, you know, new, uh, paper, llama, you know, that sort of thing, right? Uh, newspaper collector, and I think he was from Trunganu, uh, and the father was a newspaper collector. He became uh, one of the top students in the school. He got a scholarship to go to Northwestern University. He then worked in Wall Street. One of, I, I think it was very humbling, you know, he, he told me his career journey. Um, another one was the mom is uh, a vegetable seller. And on Sundays, every Sunday at 3 a.m., he has to help his mom, uh, you know, to, to deliver vegetables and, and cut vegetables or go to the, to the wholesaler and all that. And then he has to go back to school on Monday. And these two people, there are many, many stories, but I'll, I'll just give you these two, did very well in their careers, you know, very, very well. Uh, that is why I always think that, you know, if you have done something a bit more than your student life, uh, or during your student's life, uh, beyond acad uh, academics, um, it will ground you and it will refine you, you know, and refine your thinking as well as your character. You know? So um, office bearer, if you're an office bearer today, great uh, kind of, you know, make sure you leverage on that experience, you know, and, and I always say it's a privilege, right? It's a privilege if you're given the opportunity, it is a privilege. What are you going to do with that privilege, right? So take uh, advantage of it. Right. Linda, I think I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't quite, you know, get it during my university days. Um, it just so happened I'm, I'm talkative by nature. So I got always being volunteered to do it. I always resent it. Uh, so coming from that angle and hearing from Chai Ping, it connects the dot after 20 years in Korea and uh, how that actually is a privilege that is a trust given by my peers that I could do it rather That's than right. that resentment, you know, that every time I have to do the extra work. You know? That's right. <laughs> 
Yeah. So uh, having said that, I think I, I would like to hear from uh, a prof. Uh, this is about competitiveness of our talents that we churn out from university. And because we are talking about us leading ASEAN, right? So how competitive do you think that, you know, UM or uh, universities in Malaysia uh, produce talents uh, in the marketplace, uh, at least for the region? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, as a whole, okay, uh, statistic-wise, um, of course, um, in terms of uh, GE, in terms of graduate employability, okay, we could say that uh, at least from the public university, uh, we are doing okay. We are doing okay. So meaning to say that within six months, okay, our graduates secure uh, a decent job. Okay, it can be of um, you know a job that is directly um, relevant to whatever they took at the university, or it can be of you know career changing, taking something else and and then up to something else. Um, but I think um, yeah, uh, one thing that we can improve even though we are doing okay we are not excellent i would not say that we are actually excellent because um actually especially in tech career okay um programmers coders we have to import uh, some of our programmers from perhaps india from china okay even though we produce i would say sufficient number of um uh, talents in the market okay why because they said that um, the university cannot fulfill what the industry wants. Okay, it's always that. Um, let's say uh, we teach something at the university, and then, like I mentioned several times, okay, after six months or after one year, it is no longer relevant. We teach Oracle, perhaps. Okay, just example, Oracle thirteen G. Okay, by the time the student graduates, Oracle something else. Okay, and then the features different, uh, you know, the way to handle it different. And then we are always blamed by the industry saying that we are not, you know, equip our students with what the industry wants. Okay, but um, perhaps at the university sites, okay, uh, it's not our defense, okay, but it's always that we give them the fundamental knowledge. Okay, it's always the students who need to take, okay, not one extra mile, two, three extra miles to, to, to go beyond what is taught. Okay, so we give you, we teach you how to fish. No, it's not that every time we have to give you fish. Okay, we teach the students how to fish. Okay, so fishing is not easy. Okay, sometimes you land a big fish. Sometimes you land with small fish. Sometimes you land with no fish at all. Okay, but um, the most important thing is the process. So once you have the fundamentals, so whatever comes, okay, if you have to fish at the pond or you have to fish at the sea, you have got the knowledge. So now it is up to you okay, on how you should enhance your fishing skills, okay, so perhaps you don't want to use fishing rods anymore, you want to use something else, you want, you don't want to, you know, uh, fish at the pond anymore, you want to go at the middle of the sea, so it's up to you, but we provide you the skills, okay, but, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, it's always this kind of mismatch um, of what the universities provide the students, with what the industry wants. So you just imagine, okay, we got to know that industry want this. So we start implementing it to our first year student. By the time the students graduate, after three years or four years, there's something else. And then they say that, oh, the talent produced does not match the demand. Okay, so um, I would say that um, we try our best, okay. Uh, we, from time to time, okay, apart from own syllabus, okay, we uh, introduce extra uh, training, we invite people from industry to give trainings, okay, but uh, sadly, um, the, the participation from students is very low, okay, let's say we have, we say that, okay, Huawei is very interested in giving five days training on mobile apps development. It is something that is in, in the market now, okay, the mobile apps development skills, okay, but they turn up it's very less, okay, because students say, um, you know, there's not enough time because we have so many assignments, this and that. And then for us to stay at the college, 
because KL is so expensive. So we have to get ourselves involved with college activities. Otherwise, we do not have enough merit for us to stay for the next semester. So um, I think um, if you coming back to your question, Linda, on the, um, the quality of the talent, we have the quality, but that is not sufficient. Uh, like Chai Ping said, okay, you have the good CGPA, but the CGPA just lend you for the opportunity. Okay, whether you can secure it or not, okay, the, that is up to what are the extra value that you have, okay, compared to the other applicants that comes in. All of them is 3.5 and above the end CGPA is holder. Okay, everyone is looking at that. Even 3.8, we had we have got increase, uh, we have increased in number of students securing 3.7. Why? One of the one um, you know, uh, highest reason given to us, okay, okay, because they want they don't want to pay PTPTN. <laughs> okay, they get the PTPTN for free if they secure 3.7 above. So we have got uh, the number. Okay, but okay, uh, when they go, okay, whether they can secure a job or not, that is something else. I um okay, so some of them did well. I would say that some of our graduate that did not um you know get very good results they get just three pointer just three pointer three point zero one okay i would say some of these students because they know that they are lacking into something so they work hard and some of them secure um you know earlier job than those with better cgpa why because the attitude again is the attitude okay and then when when um uh, the interview asks okay uh okay uh, but uh, we are no uh, we are not no longer using this Okay, you shouldn't say that, uh, yeah, but that is what we thought at the university. The university didn't teach me this and that. You would say that, no, I did not know that, but give me chance to learn. Okay, give me three weeks to master this. Okay, and I'll be able to, you know, uh, show you what I get or what I had. Okay, so that kind of things. I think that is the thing that is lacking. It's not the, the quality. The quality is there. Okay, they are good students coming from good prestigious university okay but i think at the end it's the attitude um some students said okay i don't want to do programming that is for diploma student start from from the basic okay given whatever take it okay take yeah. it as a challenge do it okay so yeah, so, and then they say that, oh, I don't want 3,000. My friend in the other company get 3,500. I also want 3,500. Say that to Chai Ping. I don't know whether Chai Ping would accept that kind of applicants into. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I, but, I would be. Right. <laughs> I'll be interested to, to, to know from Chai Ping because Chai Ping has a global experience of working with, with multitudes of talents. And Chaiping, tell them like uh, how you actually gauge Malaysian talents against you know the global standards, because yeah. this is important. And I think today this crowd we at least can impart some of these learnings. Thanks, 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 Linda. Um, you know, uh, I'm Malaysian, and uh, you know, I never left the country again, right? Um, and I'm deeply proud. I can be cynical sometimes, but deeply proud, right? I mean. When, uh, when Linda and Katz told me that, you know, a uh, prof from UM is going to be, you know, on the panel with me, I said, you know, and I'm proud of UM, right? This is our, our premier institution, right? It's prestigious. It's produced some of the best talent in the world. Half of them are in Singapore sometimes, and I'm thinking what's going on, right? And, and if you think about the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, right? I have deep respect, right? So, and that's why I thought, uh, I know uh, Linda will tease me about, yeah, it's a Saturday, so sorry, and all that. You know, I think Prof and I made the effort to be here today uh, because we are deeply proud and uh, deeply passionate about talent, right? Um, on the one hand, you know, Prof is training talent. On the other hand, I'm at the receiving end of the talent, and hopefully I continue, you know, the good work of uh, what our institutions and, acad and academia have been doing. Um, I, I, I can't stress enough, aptitude will only get you to the door, put your foot in the door, put your little toe in the door. Attitude is the rest of it, right? Um, I, I, I think I shared with cats yesterday when we were prepping, I said that I've hired first-class students, 
I have also fired first class students. They did not pass uh, my probation period, right? And normally I like to think that I'm very gracious as an employer. Uh, my, and I make sure my line managers are very gracious, you know, as, as, a, uh, as, as an employer as well, right? And make sure we give the coaching and all that. I've also hired, you know, second class lower and third class, right? I, I, and I think there's a translation to the CGPA, I think below uh, CGPA 3 and, and 2.9 and all that. And they have done remarkably well what made them do so well, right? It is nothing but their attitude because they know. So I've had one where didn't do well in school and he explained why. And I said to my recruiter, give him the job. He was looking after his father who was dying of cancer. And that's why he couldn't focus on his studies. Uh, we hired him, we gave him a chance and he is doing remarkably well, remarkably well, right? So attitude is almost everything. I'm not saying that you shouldn't study hard uh, in school. Please don't uh, quote me on that. I would like to say, please study hard. And as what your prof says, please, you know, I mean, technology especially changes, you know, all the time, you know, all the time. I, if, I, if I think about my tech people, I mean, sometimes they tell me, I say, I don't know what you're talking about, but okay, you know. Um, it, it changes every six months, three months, one year, right? Um, and all that. So if your lecturers and, and if the university have taught you how to fish, please use that again to your advantage because technology changes all the time and you can't blame the technology for changing or can't blame your lecturers for not letting you know. All right. So that boils down to your attitude again. So I, I want to stress that please, you know, heed what uh, your professor is telling you. Now, coming to Malaysian talent, um, Experian is a global hub and one of the reasons I joined the global hub is because there are not many multinationals who have built a global hub in Malaysia. Experian is one of them. Typically, they'll go to Singapore or Hong Kong or, or somewhere. And I said that, okay, that being the case, if you're a global hub, um, I, I will join. And when I joined almost five years ago now, we had about 400 something people. Uh, today, we are over a thousand people. So I've doubled the hit count majority of my people, 90% of my, my hate count are Malaysians. So Malaysia has talent. Malaysia got talent, you know. We, are we competitive? Yes, we are. Are we going to lose out on the competitive scale if we don't buck up? We are going to lose out. I was sharing with Tats. I said, ASEAN is really bucking up. ASEAN excluding Singapore. They are when I was looking after uh, Vietnam in my old job, when I was in Accenture, I used to go to Vietnam very regularly. I have different drivers coming to pick me up from the, host uh, from the, from the hotel, right? Every driver that I speak to will, will, will tell me their story. I mean, it, it's a 45 minute journey, so they'll tell me their story. And I'm also keen to know, all right? So, and, and let me share this with you. The driver who's driving me is a driver in the day at night, he's a cook. On the weekends, he takes additional classes, night schools and all that to better himself. Now, are Malaysians in that category? I can tell you no. They're not Malaysian. I mean, your prof just mentioned, right? If there's an extra class somewhere, oh no, it's Susala, you might need to go back la, or, or something, or KL is expensive la, and all that, right? So our resilience, right, uh, has, is not as strong. Uh, some of my tech talents come from uh, Indonesia. In the past, we can say that Indonesia may not, their, their talent may not be as strong because of language capability. But I can tell you, Vietnam is catching up in terms of language because an average Vietnamese will speak Vietnamese and Japanese or Vietnamese and French, right? And, and now they are picking up English as well. Indonesia is also heading that way. And if we continue to kind of maybe be complacent, we will lose on our competitive competitiveness uh, index. Therefore, I, I, I mean, I'm a proud Malaysian, right? I have now lobbied with my global stakeholders so much to put more roles into Malaysia. Uh, all, uh, many of my, uh, we have uh, a big team, about 200 plus of us uh, um, are software engineers and technical architects. 
Um, I've got a fairly huge team of about 50 who are in data science and analytics. I talk, I think I mentioned finance, COE and all that. So we have some really strong tech talent in, in, in uh, our office and I'm bringing more roles from the globe to bring into Malaysia. I'm building up my cybersecurity space as well. So we are building our, one of our sub global hubs on cybersecurity is in Malaysia as well. As an employer, I can do that. But on, on, on the talent side, so yourself, you, you really need to kind of say, what do I want? And how do I want to play in the digital economy? If Malaysia wants to play in that digital economy, we all need to buck up. As an employer, I need to bring more higher value work into Malaysia, right? Uh, as an academic uh, institution, you need to produce people who can fish and fish in all ecosystems, whether it's a small lake or a big river or a mighty ocean, you need to be able to fish, right? So we, so this ecosystem, all of us need to collaborate, right? We, we cannot just say, oh, I offer you 3,000 tomorrow. My neighbor will offer you 3,005. 3,005, you go to Google, they'll offer you 5,000. We cannot compete that way. What we need to compete on is how do we keep getting better at what we do? And as your prof said, if I get a, an opportunity, right? Even if it's 2008, let me jump on the opportunity, even if my friends are getting 3,005, because your experience will, once you have kind of um, gathered enough experience, the money will come. If you do a great job, the money will come. So the person who started at 3,005 or 4,000, who did not go the, the extra two miles, right? Compared to you, although you started a bit lesser, you will catch up very, very fast. So as, a, as an early career person, you must build your experience, build your skills and experience. Don't just worry about, you know, is it 2008 or 3005? Um, if a fresh graduate comes to me and start talking to me about salary first, I will already minus 50% because that shows me your attitude. It doesn't show me anything else except that you're only keen, uh, you know, to, to work for money, right? Don't get me wrong, money is very, very important, but your purpose, because your journey is a 35-year journey. If you graduate at the age of 25 or 23, you know, and you retire at 60, right? It's a 35-year or 36-year journey. It's a long, long road ahead. So you must plan it very wisely. Get the experience, build your foundation and your fundamentals. Again, I want to say attitude is almost everything, Okay. Uh, attitude will open up, open up even more doors because once people see attitude, good attitude in you, you will have bosses that will say, send this person to London. And I've had uh, one of my key talents now is now based in London. She spent 10 years here in Malaysia. Uh, she just left about 10 months ago and she's doing wonders and flying the Malaysian flag very, very high, right? In our global team, right? And there are people who wait for us, even as undergraduates, right? There are, there are people who wait to join us. They keep in touch with us. They keep updated on some of the platforms that we are rolling up uh, and, and keep up also with the technology. So when they graduate, they will snap that up immediately because they are already in our radar, right? So that again tells me about attitude, you know? So attitude, you know, be, be very mindful of attitude and have that self-awareness because if it's so competitive out there, what will make you different from the rest, right? And if you think there are no opportunities out there, I can tell you as an employer, my recruiters will still kind of tell me, hey, I think hard to find, but still hard to find, you know, talent. So there are opportunities. It's whether you want to grab the opportunity. All I'll right. pause there, Linda. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Because I also got a cue from Nafisa that it crossed uh, six o'clock. And maybe okay. it's uh, time that we also open up for question and answer. Sure. sure. Yeah. Any takers? 
All right. Yes, uh, that was a very inf insightful panel, by the way. I enjoyed every minute of it. It's very amazing to see um, both sides from uh, uh, academic wise and also uh, from industry. So it's uh, really amazing. Um, yeah, actually, uh, Linda, we have a few questions on our Slido um, yes. page. I think maybe I could ask uh, Joel oh, yeah, to no. bring the yeah. slides up. Yeah. All right. Ah, so I have an interesting uh, question here. Uh, and I will just throw it and see uh, where the prof or uh, Chai Ping would want to take it. Um, I think people are interested to want to know how do they even get started uh, to acquire uh, some of these soft skills, critical soft skills, uh, and uh, analytical uh, skills. Uh, what would be your advice on just a first uh, easy step? So maybe I can answer this first, I think. Is that okay? Please, okay. Prof, please. Um, all right. So um, the analytical skills, okay, it starts with um, you know, small things that you do at home. Okay. So uh, let's say um, if your parents ask you, uh, which package should we take? Okay, so Astro is um, not offering this and perhaps we can just close Astro and just have Netflix. So which one would give more benefits? So start from there. It's not just how much okay, Astro you have to pay more, Netflix you have to pay less, but discuss also in terms of what are the offers, what the package offers. Okay, uh, discuss in terms of cost and benefits, not just the money that you have to pay, but what the package offered. Okay, that is one thing. Okay, be analytical in that sense. While you are buying clothes, okay, um, is it more, um, um, is it cheaper? Okay, let's say you have certain brands that you like. Okay, is it cheaper for you to just buy it online or is it cheaper for you to actually go to the shop and actually pay, uh, actually buy for it from the shop or uh, should you wait for, um, you know, discounts? So those kind of things. It's, it's small, it's something that we do, but you have to think, not just uh, when people give you choice. Okay, uh, which, one you want, which one you like? Uh, you want this or that? Not just simply pick, okay, pick with reason. Okay, choose something, do something with reason. Reasoned, it's like, okay, uh, you want to buy, okay, you, you want to negotiate with your parents, okay? You, you score a very good grades, okay, for the second semester results. So you want to negotiate with your parents, okay? So negotiate with facts, okay? It's not just, oh, I get three, so I want this. Why? You have to explain, make sense. So start with that. It has to start with that. So, um, you know, uh, I think as parents, um, they will ask you a lot of things. And then you say, nak bagi-bagi lah, tak nak bagi sudah. It's not that. Okay, that is that is reasoning skills. Okay, so that is how you can develop at the early stage. That is what you have to add. Uh, don't just do you know. Uh, don't do things like impulse buying. Um, you know, impulse buying. Uh, I suddenly I buy this. No such things. Okay, uh, stop doing that. Okay, because you know in the long terms. Okay, if you so use of doing that okay it, it will affect you in in so many ways okay so do that always reason okay when it's not like nanti parents kata oh uh after the talk uh nanti mak cakap satu dia cakap dua it's not that it's, dia bukan melawan tau you have to give facts okay so of course parents we we understand okay um uh, why? Because I think um, the way you think, okay, is very much influenced by what you see. Let's say you play games and then you play online games and then you, my daughter, okay, for instance, okay, 12 years old, when uh, they like to play these Roblox things. So she associated the online friends as friends, okay, which for me, they are not real friends, okay, they, they are just online friends. So uh, you know the the disability to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong is also being analytical. Okay, so um, that is one example. So how how early? Okay, if you have not started doing that, start now. Okay, so then it will brings you then then it will mold your thinking into questioning things. 
uh, instead of just accepting. Okay, it's like similar in lecture. When le your lecturer say this, so you just jot, jot down. So what you did at the end of the day, uh, uh, tomorrow is your exam time, just memorize everything, put in everything. That is not being analytical. Okay, that is just copy and paste. Okay, so CNP would not would give you good results, okay, but it will not bring you far. Okay. What things that bring you far is your curiosity. You want to know, okay, why is it like this? Okay, and then okay, your lecturer answer, and then you're not satisfied. So go and search for it. Okay. Uh, our during our time, it's difficult. You have to go to libraries. Okay, there's not much of reading materials. Okay, so we are so confined by that small world that we are in. Now, okay, the world is no limit. You have no limit to, or you have no limit to access whatever that you want. Okay, so use that. So I hope I answered that question. How early? How are we supposed to develop the analytics? Thick skill start with that start yep. questioning things <laughs> yeah i like that answer it's easy it starts at home it's like charity starts at home learning starts at home uh, i will go with the most thumbs up and i think it's appropriate that uh, uh this next one probably being addressed by chai pay because it's about salary scale and <laughs> Scope of pay, if you can see that Chai Ping, what are the differences uh, of scope uh, and would that impact uh, pay scale? Uh, let's say uh, career in data, but uh, it's perhaps the, the BI against, um, you know, the, the data science against the data engineer, against the data analyst. Um, is it different from one another? So I, I, I like to think that uh, we apply, you know, some reasoning power as what Prof says, right? Uh, when we design our pay scale. And uh, I think uh, for, for, for you uh, students out there or um, uh, fresh graduates who are now you know, on to uh, looking for a job, uh, you will be quite happy to hear that uh, for organizations like Experian, right? M many, many, many employers like us, in fact, our starting pay um, we, we don't differentiate too much, you know, it's quite a, an even starting pay, um, whether you're in finance or whether you're in, uh, in uh, data analytics or, or whether you're a technical architect, because we always think that, you know, um, the, the start, right, uh, for any of these uh, uh, roles, right, it, it's just the start and, and we always peg it against the market. And then we see, you know, what's attractive and also we look at, I mean, we are in KL. So obviously we look at, you know, the cost of living in KL and, and all that, right? So it's, it's, I must say it's an attractive um, uh, pay scale. So we don't differentiate, uh, if that's the question, right? Because we don't differentiate whether you are data analytics or a fresh finance student, because I have a big finance team as well, right? Um, or whether you're an analytics student. So we, you kind of start almost, uh, on the on the same uh, pay scale, and what differentiates is your contribution, your impact, right? Uh, and also how niche your skill will become as you kind of progress through the career ladder. So hopefully that gives you um, some some insights. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chai Ping, uh, on that. Yeah, on entry level, I have to agree because having placed like hundreds of uh, students in uh, data literate students uh, onto the industry, yeah, uh, entry point, uh, usually they're quite similar. It's what you do once you are in your career. That's the, the key. Uh, what impact uh, of your work that you produce, you know, um, that, that's the key. Who traject faster? Uh, in their career. Now we have actually about five minutes to go. So I can only pick perhaps one more uh, question. Uh, and I think the one that, that um, I kind of like uh, being triggered uh, when I, I read it, uh, it is about uh, people who are actually not liking programming. Um, and thinking that they couldn't actually embark onto a data career. Um, so I would like to actually address that. Uh, and because I've placed 
uh, scholars and the like, right? Uh, and I myself recently led a team of um, uh, data scientists uh, in a hackathon. I'm not a programmer, uh, but our team came up first. So I must say that to answer this question, it's about what kind of um, value add that you can bring into that team. For me, I'm no programmer, um, no visualizer whatsoever, but I'm good at framing the problem statement. Very good at that because I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm programmed uh, to solve problems because I am an engineer uh, trained at, in the earlier state. So as that is the qualities that I bring um, into the team. So it's what uh, actually value add that you bring. Uh, and yes, you can contribute into data career. And correct me if I'm wrong typing, you can, can chip in as well your opinion here. Yeah. yeah, correct. I, I think, um, Linda, I think you covered it. Um, because you, you don't have uh, to be a programmer, right? Um, you know, to do you know, maybe analytics, for example. You, you don't have to, as I said earlier, you know, I've got finance person who is now... Um, you know, being able to, to kind of do a bit of that analytics plus the COE sort of a work. Um, I've got, you know, non-tech people you know, who can kind of dabble, you know, in the more tech space, right? So you don't have to be, uh, if you have a passion, and I think Prof also mentioned now, there are so many courses out there. I think CATS also, you know, um, offers some, some courses out there where you can actually build your tech skills if you're a non, if you kind of are a non-tech graduate or non-STEM graduate, right, to kind of dabble in that. Yeah, and um, you, you, you don't have to be a programmer to embark on a, on a data career, right? I think, I think um, again, there are so many uh, options now, right? And so many uh, courses, like I said, right, are online uh, conveniently that you can use. And also, I think, um, you know, just to enhance it further, um, you can pair, right, with someone who is uh, maybe in that uh, data space and that, that mentor or, or you know, uh, uh, some whether it's a, a professor, you know, can, can kind of expedite that for you as well, you know. Uh, and I see that happening um, or starting to happen even more, to be honest, you know, non-programmers going into a data career. Yeah, um, perhaps uh, Linda, maybe from academic perspective, okay, should students okay. who aren't that good um, embark uh, into a data career, okay, for me, Okay, if you start to put stop to something, okay, I dislike this. So you are putting a statement, okay, that um, you're you are not going to do it. Okay, so uh, I learned from mm. my own mistake. Okay, when I did my PhD, so I, I, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a computer scientist who do not like to program. Okay, so I always have that I dislike because it's difficult and all. So let me just share my experience. Okay, when, when I did my PhD, so I'm from information system background. So I did my PhD, so I need to use some AI techniques. So I know that that is the solution, but because it involves you know, programming, okay, and I have to really learn new language at that particular time. So I just put it aside. So I wasted one year trying to find other solutions. And then I said that, okay, it, this cannot be because I just have three years to complete everything. So I go back to the things that I discarded and I particularly work on it, and that is the solution. So, so what is the story to this? <laughs> if I do not put that aside earlier, I should have completed that one year earlier. Okay, so the moral here is that you can, uh, you can, yes, of course you can have your preference, okay? But do not say no to it. Okay, because when you say no, or you try to, you know, uh, avoid it, then you are actually, you know, uh, leaving that out as option. Okay, and then perhaps if you cannot solve the problem, then you have to go back to the things that you have put aside. So, you know, you have wasted some time. So, yes, we, we can dislike, but okay, give it a chance. Okay, do not just, uh, you know, put it away. Give it a chance. So, Yes, you don't this. Uh, you don't like, but that is the people expectation of you, especially when you graduate from computer science. You should be able to code, right? So 
when people expect you to do something and then what happened you cannot do it so that is why you know people say okay the, the graduate is no good it's not that you know good okay because you find it difficult you just don't want to do it okay we have taught you how to fish but you do not want to use that knowledge okay uh, give it a try i would say give it a try okay you might one day love what you hate before Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've got a request by Nafisa, though we have surpassed 620. Uh, she said that the last two kind of like intertwine uh, about branding for future, um, you know, job, um, landing that job and, be, uh, and stand out. So I think this really like should, should go to Chaiping, <laughs> standing out in their CV and how they even brand themselves even before. Um, where do they start making their impression? Thanks, Nafisa, <laughs> for giving me more air time. Uh, thank you. I guess, you know, um, I saw another question also around you know, how many applicants we get and, and all that. Obviously, we, we do get a lot of um, applications. Um, could be hundreds, sometimes thousands, but you know, it, it's still you know, quite a lot. And how then do we kind of see through? I think very importantly, you know, uh, when you write your, your CV, I mean, now there are so many ways in, the, in, in my day and Prof can probably uh, relate to this. It was all, you know, a hard copy and make sure you type it properly and then you take it to the printing shop and, and, and all that, right? But today, there are so many ways. Uh, now, you know, in, in XPU, we've got something called Smart Recruiter. You know, there is, there's some AI at the end, uh, at the back of it and, you know, people kind of submit through, you know, Smart Recruiter and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So then, what are some of the keywords that maybe we extract, right? And then from, um, you know, our, our system, and uh, we, we look at it. So if it's a, a, a role that looking for, say, you know, data science or, you know, analytics or, or data modeling and all that, make sure like some, some words like data is in there, right? So that, that helps us to filter faster. And also I think, you know, um, how, how you write your CV, don't, don't give us a thesis. You know, in the past, you know, I, I've seen people giving us thesis and we just don't have time to, to uh, go through all of it. Um, when my recruiters actually start filtering through, I think, you know, sometimes the cover letters may say something about you or the way you present your CV, it will say something about you as well. Some people are actually very good at giving us very concise yet, you know, um, very, uh, you know, like very complete CV, right? So on, on one or two pages, they're able to tell their story. So be able to tell that story, what's your narrative, right? Uh, I think that's important, right? Um, and also, you know, if, if you have done, do highlight what you've done at university. I mean, your good scores or, you know, you're on the dean's list or, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have led, um, you know, some, some student council president of, of certain clubs. I think these are things that, you know, that will help you stand out a little bit more, right? But on the converse, I mean, don't, don't view it, you know, like, oh my God, I'm one of the many, many, you know, people out there because my recruiters are actually very, very good. What they do is they give opportunities, right? And we call it powering opportunities. It doesn't mean that just because you haven't done this and that, right, uh, we won't give you an opportunity. So if let's say you, you, you say something like, you know, uh, I'm very passionate about data. I'm very passionate about, you know, uh, the digital economy. These are things that, that, that will help you stand out. Or if you can talk something about the uh, digital blueprint, the Malaysian digital blueprint, these are things that will help because that just shows that you're going, you know, the extra mile, the extra two miles or the extra three miles, you know, to understand the world around you, right? Because you cannot just say, oh, my lecturers didn't say this to me. University didn't, you know, teach you. As what Prof said, you know, now um, information is at your fingertips. You know, you, you just press a button, all sorts of information come you. So you cannot say, oh, my teacher didn't say this. My mother never taught me that. Or, you know, my, 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 my professor didn't give us the latest technology. It, it, it's, it's not um, relevant anymore, right? And it's not appropriate anymore, right? So that's where, you know, and, and if you can kind of show that in your CV, um, that will already, you know, uh, stand out, you know, a little bit from your peers. Hopefully that answers 
um, your question and I and I you know I encourage you to be enthusiastic right when you write your CV be enthusiastic because your enthusiasm and your passion will show in how you write and what you write you know yes there are thousands out there but doesn't matter you know don't give up uh, and that will build your resilience and keep trying. As I said, you know, there are some undergraduates who wait two, three years to work for us. And I'm like, I'm not Google, you know, I'm not Apple, you know, but you want to work for us, really? You know, and my recruiters will come and tell me, my team will say, you know, this guy, he's now with us already. Uh, he, he's waited so long, you know, and uh, so don't, don't give up. Keep trying, keep refining yourself because it is character building. as well. Again, uh, let me remind you, uh, it's a 30, 35 year journey. It's a long road ahead. And once you've got this privilege, I said this to Linda yesterday, how are you going to pay it forward? Once you've got this privilege, because by giving you an opportunity to come for an interview, by giving you an opportunity uh, to start you know, your career with us, right, or give you a role, I would have deprived a friend, your friend, a peer, or someone else. So what are you going to do with this privilege? I think that's very important. Because once we keep doing that and paying it forward, and uh, changing the little world around us, I really think the world can be a better place. Malaysia, truly bole, I, I really believe so. <laughs> I love that ending, Malaysia really bole, because Chai Peng today, I really like, um, I was thinking about how do I want to end uh, this session, right? And it's just, it, it, it just, uh, to me, uh, what I wanted to say was that don't be a talent that is asal bole, be a talent that is Malaysia bole, and you actually ended up with that as well. So yeah, um, is there anything else, pesanan penaja, uh, perhaps from uh, Dr. Mai? Because <laughs> I dah end up with with the don't be asal um, bole. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Um, uh, Okay, everyone is, you throw a stone, now everyone's a graduate. Okay, they graduate from whatever universities. Okay, so what differentiate yourself from others is the thing that will bring you further. Okay, uh, so don't pretend because pretending is not, is, is temporary. Okay, so build up okay, uh, your uniqueness. Okay, know yourself, know yourself. Okay, know yourself, know how to know, and then don't ask me questions how to know that you should know yourself. Okay, uh, which part that you are good at, build on that talent. Okay, some, uh, and then we, we are talking about soft skills, okay, able to communicate. Maybe that is not your uh, cup of tea. Okay, but what are other talents that you have that you think people do not have that? So during interview, you might, you might get the lowest marks. Okay, but it is sufficient for you to get hired, perhaps. Okay, and then you build on your talent. Okay, build on um, you know the strength that you have. Do not copy. Okay, be yourself. I think I think um, it works uh, at least for me. Okay, not sure about others. Okay, but I think Linda also admit. Okay, um, because uh, she talks a lot. So during the day, she, she uh, she's been given you know a lot of tasks. Now she realized. Okay, the it is a blessing in disguise. Okay, so do not take too long to realize that. Okay, know yourself. What is your strength? Okay, and build on that. I think that is all Thank from you, me. Dr. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Chai Ping, I think uh, you mentioned uh, empathy two, three times. Maybe you want to wrap up with that. Yeah, empathy. I think, um, you know, um, you know, the world has, uh, I mean, with the pandemic, of course, you know, uh, it, it's just become harder. Uh, I think uh, the burning platform, you know, especially for young talents, right, like our audience here, you know, uh, has become even more real, right? I think people talk about affordability, you know, and, and, and they worry about their future and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, I really want to, to tell you, right, um, we as employers and, you know, just like what Prof is saying now, right, we have put in so much emphasis right on uh, empathy and for me you know in a virtual world we all operate in a virtual world. classes are online you know we all overnight had to you know just do business online everything online right um you know virtual empathy has become really real um 
even more than before. Last time people just talk about empathy, right? But I, I really think virtual empathy, you know, it's become even more important, right? Uh, in, in our kind of world today. So, you know, all is not lost uh, to, to our, you know, young talent out there because, you know, many of us as employers, as leaders, uh, as teachers, as professors, as parents, right? I think we have really stepped up, you know, in experience, you know, we really have stepped up in terms of educating, creating the awareness, right, for our leaders to make sure that empathy is kind of stepped up. So if you come in, you know, uh, into the working world, right, in a world I experience and many other employers out there, because there's now so much more empathy and virtual empathy, which I really emphasize on, you know, take that bold step. And your professor has said this so many times, right? Be bold, be genuine, be true to yourself, you know, step into this new world, right? Uh, and the corporate world and, and, and tell, ask yourself what, you know, how you can contribute, what you can do, you know, no, and, and, and cast away the entitled mindset, right? I think the new generation, you know, sometimes people say very entitled and all that because, you know, you go online shopping, click, your parcel will come in two days. So it's very entitled. Everything, you know, is, you know, at speed, right? So you think that I press Google, Google gives you the answer. So, but when you come into the real world, pace yourself and be true to yourself because you will not get the answers today. You may only get the answers like some of us only 20 years later, you know, Prof said, you know, it could be a blessing in disguise. Linda is in that category as well. When I, same thing for me. There are things I only discovered, you know, uh, recently, you know, when I thought, oh, you know, my, my teachers used to make me be MC here, la, and, and, and all sorts of things. Why me? I always said, why me? But then you realize, you know, when you accumulate all these right, over a period of time, and sometimes even at work, right? I mean, I double head, triple head, I do two big roles today. And I always say, oh, why me again? But then I realized, hey, but, you know, that has given me that privilege. You know, if I see it that way, then we, we, we learn better we learn more and we have been given again the privilege and the opportunity to do more for humanity, isn't it? So when you put it there and then you think about it as a purpose, right? Then you say, okay, lah, whether it's 2008, it's okay, it's okay, you know, uh, because it's a long road ahead for you, you know? So, um, so I, I like to say that, you know, the world has hopefully um, become a bit, a bit more empathetic lah, because of the pandemic, right? So as you step out into this world, you know, be brave, um, be kind, right? Be kind because you have been given the privilege and please, you know, you in turn will need to have the empathy to pay it forward to many, many more who will need your help someday, right? So that is really, I mean, um, my appeal to you, <laughs> yeah, uh, our young talent and we look to you, right, to our future, you know? Uh, I, I really do. I mean, I've got uh, uh, young uh, adults. Uh, my, my son is 18 and I say the same to him, you know. I said, you know, if you can help your friend, you can be a counsellor or, or, you know, be, be uh, you know, a counsellor to your friends, you know, and help them, right? I, I think you have already made the world a little bit better. Correct. With thank you so much. Note, yeah, with that note, I really want to thank both ladies who, you know, I, we just reach out to and just said yes to sacrificing our weekends and all that because we are addressing youth who matters to us. And that's very important. And, uh, you know, no money can buy this precious time that I spend with both ladies. So with that, Nafisa, all yours. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much. I think that was a really powerful ending. <laughs> I loved it so much. And yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think, yeah, I couldn't say uh, enough thank yous uh, to Linda, Professor Maizatul, um, Chai Ping, I really appreciate your time for joining us today and spending your Saturday with us. Um, I think it's amazing. Thanks, Linda, really, for inviting remarkable speakers today from both the training and receiving side of talents. It's very, um, yeah, it's very insightful for us. So I uh, just want to mention again, like, thanks, Linda, for like really sharing about the context of what's happening in this world in terms of uh, unemployment. And and 
thanks for sharing about Project uh, 2100 as well. So I'm sharing the link here because I think really this is not the chance to miss free resources to upskill yourself in the technical skills that would be an asset in the workforce. But again, not forgetting to work on your soft skills, right? We've I think uh, it's been emphasized many times how important that is. So and yeah, very interesting watermelon analogy, Prof. Maizatul. I <laughs> makes it easy to remember. I think I really enjoyed all of your analogies. Um, and typing, um, paying it forward. That's such a wholesome concept. And yeah, I hope that all hiring managers would have this mindset. And yeah, I believe all the delegates here have learned a lot from the panel session. I think we enjoyed it as much as um, yeah, everyone here. So yeah, I just want to say that coming from a psychology background myself, well, having an interest in data science and tech, the overall session here was very empowering to encourage me to to pursue that career with all of these resources available, right? So thank you so much again. <laughs> and before we wrap up, let's, um, yeah, I'd like to invite all the delegates here to open up your cameras so we can take a group photo. And yeah, we'll be wrapping up in a minute. So I think I'll pass it on to yeah, Joe. We'll be helping with um, taking a photo. So yeah, everyone, please turn on your cameras. We'd like to see your faces. This is the last session already. Um, so yeah. All right, let's just wait for a bit. So pro, yes, we have amazing seekers here <laughs> today. So yeah. All right, all right, let's wait for a couple more seconds for people to turn on their cams. Thanks, Nurul. Awesome. All right, I'm going to take the picture in three, two, one. Maybe we can take another one in three, two, one. All right, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, please, to all the delegates here, please take a few minutes to fill in the feedback form.